So, Eric Holthouse is uh, here from Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm here in the Hudson Valley in New York. We're both paying a lot of attention to Pope Francis and um, his 190-something page encyclical, which as a, I think. In, yeah, in a few hours, it'll be um, available, the, the official English translation. We've all been kind of struggling to get through Italian translations. I thought it was cool that you had a, a, a photo editor and a and an intern at uh, it was at Slate who helped. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, you were, you had the idea of discussing some aspects of this, including how a moral case for action on climate change plays or, or um, relates to what's happening in developing countries. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mean, a lot of these these articles kind of come to an end and, you know, you state the problem and you say, well, what are you going to do about it? And the question is often open ended um, or the answer, I guess. And um, I, I think there's, there's a clear case for, um, for, you know, an, an increase or at least a, a fully funding of the already existing commitments from the developed world to um, relieve, uh, I mean, in, in India, especially, you know, with, with the, um, they just had one of the worst heat waves in recorded history as far as um, mortality. And, um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a human rights issue at this point to provide electricity to everyone in the country and, you know, increase the amount of air conditioning and there's some really scary studies coming out as far as as in 20 to 30 to 50 years, it may be really difficult to even work outside in India um, in certain times of the year, you know, especially May, right before the monsoon starts, where you have um, heat index above 120, you know, or in during the day and then above 100 at night. I mean, there's no chance for the body to, to rest during that. Um, and so air conditioning becomes in that, in that scenario, really important. Um, so I think that there is a, a moral and human rights issue to be made as far as um, increasing the amount of electricity available in India. Um, and, you know, being funded by rich countries. Uh, because we're the we're the ones that are that have made you know this, this issue uh, historically um, the biggest emitters, and there's a, a clear chance for you know um, somebody like um, Obama to to really kind of ramp up um, funding into the, the Green Climate Fund or whatever you know process. Um, um, to, you know, boost the ability of, of, of renewable. Um, and, I mean, honestly, even coal at this point, there is there is going to be a, a role for coal in India uh, for the foreseeable future. There's just no way around it. So um, I, I, I think at some, at, in some level, it's kind of morally not appropriate for us to criticize, us in the U.S. to criticize coal use. Yeah, we're not, you know, totally zeroing it out here first. Yeah, well, you're you're on, you're spot on. Um, I just was, uh, I did an interview, a video interview recently with Jai Ram Ramesh, who, until fairly recently, was the chief uh, climate negotiator for India and the minister of the environment. He has this book out. I just happened to have it here because I was just interviewing him. Uh, Green signals, which is. Um, about his experiences in climate diplomacy and dealing with uh, India's what he calls it, uh, raucous democracy, and and they need energy, as you say, they need energy um, badly. It, it, this gets oversimplified sometimes, as you know. While they need base load power, they need big coal-fired power plants so they can have industry for all the urbanization populations. Um, but they also, right now, they need um, distributed power too, and they're one of the most interesting people in India. I've met in recent years is Harish Hande, who uh, runs a successful um, profit-making company, 
that does uh, solar and bio biogas uh, and other installations in, at the village scale. And for the, for the people who have not moved into cities yet, you know, hundreds of millions of Indians still live in rural situations. They'll never be on a grid as we know it. Yep. So, so they're like in all of the, I mean, talk about all of the above. You know, Obama talks about all of the above. In India, it, it really is all of the above. You need, you need coal. And as, as, as Ramesh told me, you know, Modi is correct to, and, and ethical to say that they'll be doubling their coal um, uh, production by 2020 or so just to um, have a modicum of reliable electricity in their cities. But that's yeah. not, but that on its own is not enough. Yeah, yeah, you want to, I mean, you want to try to limit coal as much as possible because there's all, you know, kinds of problems with coal that's been discussed so much, you know, with oh, air pollution, pollution yeah. thing, of course, but, but at this point, it's kind of like, we're all hands on deck to try to, um, to stop people from dying from not having air conditioning. I mean, <laughs> it's just kind of not defensible when we have, so when we use so much energy, and I think that's kind of what the Pope is trying to get out. You know, I read the as much as I could of the translation, um, which is obviously you know not official translation yet. But um, but he is he is especially tough on rich countries with a consumer driven lifestyle, saying we have to seriously rethink pretty much our entire way of living in the world to come in line with what it means to be, um, you know, people that care for each other and really respect the fact that every human on earth has a right to life and has a right to thrive in a world that, you know, uh, you know, globally average, we have enough for everyone. And, and it's the, and he's, you know, he's calling out inequality and he's calling out, um, you know, un unfair practices of, multinational corporations that go into developing countries and leave his quote was um oh man now i forget but it it's something like um lifeless villages or something like that behind where you know there, there's little regulation in a lot of developing countries um for for pollution because they're they're desperate for the 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 jobs and desperate for the income so um it, it's the exploited exploit exploitation of of poor countries that he is is kind of really railing against in and it's a very wide-ranging document from you know pretty much all aspects of modern environmental um issues he, he discusses and um he's really challenging and i felt like he was talking to me honestly um as somebody who lives in the u.s saying that you know if if we don't really think about who we're affecting with our day-to-day -day actions we can't say that we are um you know living a morally just and ethical life um and, and it's not only um catholics but non-catholics too i mean he's going to be joined on stage um by um representatives from lots of different faiths and even even an, an atheist on, on stage with him when he is making this presentation on, on Thursday tomorrow. So um, it, it's really kind of a, a document that's written on behalf of the poorest in the world that are being affected most by climate change and saying like, listen, we, we, we need your help. And, and it's, not, it, it's not enough for, for us to continue on as it is because obviously that's not working anymore. We need to just try to, try to think of, we have, we have a chance to remake a world that that we want to have that is you know better and more fair and giving chances uh for for people who historically haven't had had chances yeah um the uh, this idea of um it's about balance um i think rebalancing the human adventure which has been you know we had a hundred year head start and um, it's just hard to believe. You see it so many times. This is why I embraced uh, Ban Ki-moon's uh, Sustainable Energy for All call, um, initiative back when he started in 2011, which is very resonant with what the Pope is calling for. And, and Ban Ki-moon talks about like in, in post-war Korea, when he, uh, when he was studying for exams as a kid, when, when he was just doing his homework, he had a kerosene lamp. And only when he was studying for his exams did he have a candle. 
and, and this is Korea, you know, just a uh, half century ago. And now there are still places on the planet where that's the norm for hundreds of millions of people. And, and, and so I'm really glad, by the way, to see the Pope stressing, uh, uh, maybe you call it energy equity, essentially, even as he talks about climate action, because um, it, this really is to the world, as I've said for a while, has two energy challenges right now. One is how to produce less carbon in places that are already kind of, you could say, over-energized. And the other is how to provide more energy to places that are clearly under-energized. Now, who pays for it gets to be really tough. You yeah. know, $100 billion a year um, is a nice figure that came out of Copenhagen and uh, subsequent uh, meetings. But having that happen in, in reality, and what's what, you, what you'll see, you're already seeing this fight over when rich countries start to, to, to pony up, how much of that is actually new money. This is the uh, developing country concern right now. That's just sort of repurposed uh, foreign aid. Um, that's not going to be satisfactory. And, and that's going to lead to more uh, problems in Paris, which is one reason, even with the Pope, the momentum out of what he's doing, I, I don't foresee um, big breakthroughs in, in Paris. And, and But I do see lots of potential for the kinds of partnerships you were sort of... Uh, Speaking about, and I think the Pope would like to see, you know, where where American initiatives um, can really facilitate getting smart energy choices to where they're needed. And and as we were saying, you know, that could include if if you're going to burn coal, make sure it's the most it's a supercritical plant, it's the best possible, uh, most efficient, you know, the most uh, kilowatt hours per per pound of black rock, and uh, capture whatever you can of the. Uh, in, the that, um, I heard something. Anyway, uh, I think it's a good. I think he's doing a good thing in, in identifying both prongs of that challenge. Yeah. So, so when it comes to, um, you know, the the run up to Paris, um, it, it doesn't feel like really anything has changed. I mean, the, a, a lot of. Um, you know, the nuts and bolts calculations of some of the pledges um, are are just kind of restatements of things that have already been, I mean, that's kind of what it's designed to do anyway, but, um, but, but this whole, you know, peer pressure model of ratcheting up one at one another's plan, it doesn't seem to me like it's really happening. And, and I mean, it's, I, and I've, and I've talked about before that, um, you know, it, if there's not even a, uh, um, you know, what, what the word of, if there's not even, you know, like a smoke screen of intent of trying to keep to a two degree C limit, um, then it's kind of not, I don't really know where the relevance of the Paris um, agreement is, you know, it, that there's been kind of a ratcheting back of of rhetoric, I feel like from the from the top levels of the UN um, leading in, and I realize that that Paris is not going to solve everything for sure. Um, but if we're not even trying to get on a two degree C path, and I'm not really sure what the point is, honestly. <laughs> That's just my pessimism or maybe idealism talking. Well, it's, I think one of the big shifts I've seen, you know, and I'm either cursed or blessed to have been writing about this now since before there was the first treaty since 1988. And the, the old expectation was that there would be a binding top-down pollution control style treaty, just like we had with the Montreal Protocol, like we had with the Clean Air Act in this country, that this was a pollution problem. And if you just put a lid on it, and uh, enforce that, that it'll, it'll stop a diverse world from um, ruining the climate system. I think it's become clear that it's not that way, mainly because of this issue that the Pope has articulated, which is the imbalance. Uh, as India, India describes it as carbon space, you know, that if we talk about it as a budget, yeah. they, they will fight tooth and nail, uh, and justifiably to say most of that space that's left is for us to uh, burn coal carefully as carefully as we can to to get our people off poverty like China did, and mm -hmm. and so those uh, what that's led that led to, to like I think in Copenhagen it led to completely break a complete breakdown in Lima it led to an acceptance of the reality that 
um, whatever climate agreements come forward here, they won't be a treaty in the old sense. As, as you don't even hear the word treaty, it's agreement. Um, it will, there will be binding, there can be binding aspects of it, but there won't be binding emissions tallies and timetables as Europe, um, even as recently as, well, in recent weeks, they still sort of have this expectation uh, there'll be targets and timetables and sort of a Kyoto style approach. What, what you see, uh, but here's the deal. It's like there's been a recognition that the only way to have a global agreement among, you know, 196 plus countries with such variegated uh, circumstances is for it not to be binding. That, that you have this paradox, you have two choices. One is to be inclusive and non-binding, and the other is to be uh, small. Uh, you know, a small group of rich countries could potentially have a, you know, a, an agreement. Uh, and you'll see, and, and so the question is that good or bad? It's like, it just is what it is. To me, uh, I, uh, the world, it's like, you know, it, you know, people say the UN sucks, and I say, well, imagine the world without it. And, and so the, treaty, the treaty trajectories we're on suck, but, but if they weren't there, uh, if there wasn't this annual coming together where countries uh, pony up their progress and, and, and talk about measurable, reportable, verifiable emissions um, inventories, and where there will be more of an expectation that if you pledge money, you know, it actually has to start showing up, or we won't even agree to any of these things. I, I think in the long run, it's still a valuable process. But one of the other things I've learned in all this time is that um, most of the time treaties, uh, at least this kind of thing, reflect what's possible more than they determine what's possible. Mm -hmm. that, that they're basically reflecting what each nation feels it's capable of bringing to the table. They're not really going to be, they're not, it's not like some grand nod that the climate gods are turning that magically makes us all behave. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of what's happening here again, is that, um, that I mean, in, in that way, the, the, the US-China agreement was kind of more important than Paris because it showed that there are, you know, there are still room to be gained, you know, by working one-on-one, -on -one, you know, face-to-face, -face, like 1950s style political, you know, negotiation with world leaders. And, um, and I think that that's, um, that, that, that's where, that's where the Pope is really important. I think um, in, in, if he can change anything at all, it's with, face-to-face -face meetings with world leaders. And I was speaking with um, the editor of America Magazine um, today, um, Jesuit Magazine in the U.S., that, um, that said, you know, the Pope, you can tell that the Pope is influential because of all of the world leaders lined up to, to try to, to be appearing with him in public. And he's already, the, um, he's already met um, with, more worldly or had more meetings with world leaders than Benedict did in, in his entire papacy. So, um, you know, this is, this is where he can really, uh, make change is by, you know, putting that little, that little bug in the, in the ear. Um, and, and maybe, you know, when, when, when Obama and Merkel and, um, and everyone else is, is in those, those, um, anonymous conference rooms and, in Paris that, that they'll remember, um, you know, this is, this is something that is important. We should be thinking about, um, be, beyond our national interest, maybe our, like our strict national interest to uh, the broader, you know, like hundreds of years time scale on to, um, the impacts of our actions now on, on people that don't necessarily have a voice usually in these processes. So, um, and, and yeah, and that's where, you know, the Pope in one person can, can kind of speak for the world for, I mean, he's first Pope from the developing, developing world. Um, and, and, and I think that carries, that, that, that's, that's where his kind of mandate comes from right now. Yeah. And, and he'll always get some pushback for um, the sort of North South anti-corporate tensions mm -hmm. that are in some of what he's saying, but. But I agree with you that overall, um, I think he's in, in, he will be a very positive influence on, on this. The other thing, and I just wrote about this today again, is his involvement, um, I think, demonstrates and helps concretize 
that this isn't just about science. That, as I wrote today, and I've just kind of said this in many different ways over the years, science just sort of paints the picture or the, sort of delineates the ball field. And it's our values um, and our relationships that determine how we play a game or whether it's soccer or football or baseball. And values here are the thing that determines everything, the speed with which we do something, the equity with which we pursue solutions, the, um, the, the decisions about how much we invest to make poor countries more resilient. Those are, those are values decisions. They're not science. And, and his involvement, I think, and actually when I was at the Vatican for that four-day meeting a year ago, that when you look at the language in this thing, this encyclical, a lot of it built out of that meeting. Um, it was scientists and philosophers and theologians, and um, everyone, when, everyone was talking across discipline in ways that were invaluable. In the thing, I, I don't know if you saw, but I quoted him a couple of times. Walter Monk, who, who a year ago was 96 year old, he's one of the, the great oceanographers, oceanographers of the 20th century. You know, at, at dinner, I said to him, you know, so how's this going to work? And he said, uh, you probably saw the quote, he said, it'll take a miracle of, uh, a miracle of love and unselfishness. He didn't wow. say it'll take like a better carbon capture technology or, yeah, or, a, or a CMIP 6 model. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, I think he was spot on. Um, and I do think, you know, one reason I'm relatively optimistic, despite having done with this, all this stuff for so long, um, is uh, I see our capacity to be uh, empathic, to have a worldview, a true worldview, uh, to um, consider the needs of um, developing countries, given that they're so interlaced with their own needs now, um, economically and otherwise, to, um, to, to recognize that this issue isn't like a simple pollution problem like we thought it was. I think our capacity for all those things is, is rising uh, through the uh, connectedness we have. And um, if we use these tools, you know, constructively, and there's still some who don't, as we all know, especially in the climate fight. But, but I, I think it's okay. I think I think I see signs, of, and also when you see actual changes, like the fact that emissions didn't rise even with a growing economy last year. Um, there's there's plenty of reason to think we could. Um, well, I, I allude sometimes to the play by um, um, oh god, it's called The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilder. When I was a kid, I remember seeing this play. But it's about the Anthropus family, and there's a basically it's a spirally ugly. Uh, misadventure after misadventure, uh, climb up um, civilization. And that's kind of like, um, I think there's a way to get through this and not end up in an OMG kind of um, outcome. Yeah, uh, I mean, you can get that glimpse of, of, of steering, gradually steering away from the worst case scenario, you know, see those, that, that graph with the uh, all the different pathways and, you know, the black line with us riding right along the worst case um, scenario. And you can see a glimpse of, these are the kind of things that, that you expect to see if, if you um, start to diverge from that worst case scenario. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how, what happens. I mean, the next, Few months and the next few decades are going to be really fascinating. I think they are. They are going to be fascinating. And and uh, and I, when I talk to young people, particularly, I try to um, articulate. And I don't think it's wishful that I can't think of a more um, meaningful time in, in the, the history of our species to be alive. Yeah. Now, every generation can say that. People are struggling to get through World, World War II said it. Uh, but just think, when you look at our trajectories as a species, you know, we've been on this Zoom mode the last 200 years, and we know that by mid-century that's going to change, just the population trajectory. And you see there are signs of peak transportation. You see what used to be thought of as bow, business as usual. The China, China's burst of coal use in the early 2000s was a, an anomaly. It wasn't the new normal. The, you can you can kind of say, let's engage. What can we do to tweak these, these knobs a, a, little, a little better? What's, what's my role? And one of the wonderful things about climate, the climate problem is everyone can play a role. You don't have to be an engineer or physicist. You can be a, a pope or you know, a preacher. You can be an artist. You can be a musician. You can, um, as that young guy at the um, University of Minnesota who's turned climate data into music. There's something for everybody to do. 
it's, it's so freaking complicated that everyone has a role to play. And that, that again, makes me feel uh, energized more than depressed. Yeah, and, and there's one more reason for, for you know, uh, assisting with electrification of, of India. You know, maybe the solution is going to come from, in, or a solution will come from India, too. Yeah, and I've seen it again, Harish Hande. Look him up. <laughs> his company is called... His one company one is called Selco. Million brains is a lot of brains. So, yeah. well, this is good. Um, we we could do this fairly regularly. It'd be kind of fun. <laughs> we can grow old together talking about this. Yeah, <laughs> and doing things about it. Great. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate on a short notice um, because um, I, um, I I love I love reading your blog because because you're talking about things that not everyone is talking about or maybe they're talking about but they don't want to put to paper because it's not going to necessarily drive clicks <laughs> yeah. you know it's meaningful and it's really important and um and i and i think that that um that you know yeah i, I mean just like just like with um with the pope i i, I feel like we have a lot to learn from people that are are different than us so that's why um, it's nice to it's nice to hear people taking you know religion and ethics at least for this week seriously you know as on the on, on the same level as the economy which tends to normally win out in these kind of debates. So, I, well, I, as I put on the blog, my favorite passage. And this is from a, one of my readers did a translation, so you know we'll see what the official one is was where he talks about diversity. Uh, you know, he's got pretty strong positions on uh, agriculture industry and stuff. But then he says here, let us admit that different visions and ways of thinking about this situation and about its possible solutions have developed. And then he says, from on one extreme, on the other extreme, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, um, uh, humanity should reduce its presence on the planet and prevent any kind of interaction. With it. Between these extremes, reflection should identify possible future scenarios because there's not only one possible solution, this would be room for a variety of contributions which could enter into a dialogue aimed at a full answer. And I think, uh, you know, again, when you look at the super wicked nature of the challenge, uh, that's implicitly part of the reality that there will be variegated solutions, views of what's right. You just, just think, you know, Bill McKibben doesn't like nuclear power, George Mondial in England thinks nuclear power is vital. So are they bad or good? No, they're just different. Um, so, so that's really important part of it too. So let's just, you know, let's keep, we could do, I would do this regularly. We could assess the, uh, the, the week or the month's news and see how we take each other's temperature. <laughs> so uh, uh, have fun tomorrow. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you too. All right.